All right, so I just put together my first uh, tech vlog here. The genesis of this channel is that I recently started a gaming channel on Flight Simulator 2020, and I've been enjoying that so much that I decided to branch out and do some tech videos as well. So if you're interested in Flight Sim, I'll include a link in the description below to that channel as well. But otherwise, stick around. We're going to talk a little bit about Azure today. There are some amazing resources you can use to build applications on Azure, like AKS, Azure Functions, serverless databases, the list goes on and on. That's not what I'm going to be talking about today. Instead, I'm going to actually be looking at three very plain but very useful services that you can use uh, to make the management and support of your applications just that little bit easier when you're deploying applications to Azure. All right, let's get straight to the list. So number three is alerts. Alerts are everywhere in Azure, and they let you keep an eye on almost any resource that you can create on the portal. There are a bunch of different metrics that you can be alerted on. Depending on the resource that you're using, obviously the metrics will be different, but typical examples would be the number of errors that are being produced by a service, the number of active connections, the number of incoming requests, outgoing requests, total execution time. Those types of metrics can be easily alerted on from the alerts uh, system in Azure. You can also use them to know whenever a change is made on a resource. Uh, so that if you want to audit those changes in some way, you could easily be triggered every time someone makes a change so that you know when a change has been made, why it's been made, etc. And if none of that works for you, you can actually create your own alerts based off of data that you've collected in Application Insights. So when an alert is triggered, you can have it do almost anything you want, from sending an email to calling a webhook, or even invoking an Azure function that runs some custom logic that you've built and deployed to Azure yourself. The way you define how to react to the action is fairly flexible. You can have it do one action, you can have it do multiple actions. It's really up to you. You have almost unlimited flexibility from that perspective. There are a few different ways you can create alerts, either manually in the portal, you can automate them through the REST API, or you can even create them through, if you're using a tool like Terraform, the choice is really up to you. Obviously, as an application or a bunch of applications become more complex, you're going to want to move your alerting to something a little bit more scalable. But when you're just starting out building an application, the alerting system that's built into Azure and all the different services in Azure can be sufficient to get you going. So just to give you a few ideas on how you could use alerts, I'll just give you a couple examples of how I've used it previously. You could use an alert to, to react to messages in some type of messaging system that aren't being processed, whether it's Service Bus, Event Hub, Event Grid, and somehow react to that fact that nothing's being processed anymore. Maybe the downstream service stopped working and you need to restart it, or you just want to send an email to the support team for them to investigate. You could use it to automatically resize an Azure SQL database when the disk usage goes past a certain percentage. Let's say the disk usage gets to around 95%. When your alert gets triggered, it launches off uh, some type of automation that's going to scale the Azure SQL database so that you don't run out of disk space and your system stays up and running. All right, on to number two, log analytics. Log analytics is part of something called Azure Monitor. And in fact, I did mention it earlier, but alerts is also part of Azure Monitor technically. Azure Monitor is kind of a large product which encompasses a bunch of different components, including both log analytics, alerts, and application insights as well. It's effectively the one-stop shop where any type of log data is made available for you to query. It can be tricky to figure out how to find the information you're looking for, but it's usually in there. You just have to figure out how to look for it. The documentation on log analytics is fairly basic and it doesn't really give you a good idea of what log analytics can actually do for you. So for example, some services are automatically configured to write to log analytics. Azure's Kubernetes service, the, their managed uh, Kubernetes service, is one such service. All the logs that are generated from the Kubernetes cluster are captured by the logging agent and pushed into log analytics for you. So you can see everything related to your cluster within log analytics. 
For other servers, you can enable diagnostic events, which will stream all the diagnostic data for that service to your log analytics uh, workspace and allows you to query that data afterwards as well. If there's something weird that's happening with the service that you're using, and you're not quite understanding what's going on, that's probably the best way to go about it. Just enable the diagnostics for it, have a look in log analytics to see what's going on. Log analytics uses a language called Custo or Custo, not quite sure how to pronounce it, uh, for querying. The IntelliSense for it in the portal is actually really good. If you're familiar with SQL, honestly, I don't think you need to spend more than a couple minutes trying to figure it out because the IntelliSense just works so well. It is similar to SQL. The order of statements is a little bit different, but other than that, it's you can pick it up really quick. So here are a few different ways that I've used Log Analytics just to give you a couple ideas. I've used it to understand where costs were coming from in a resource that was consuming a lot more than it should have been. I've used it to query uh, Kubernetes logs, as I mentioned before. And I've also used it to diagnose different uh, bugs and problems that have been occurring in uh, an application. Since everything is logged there, it made it really easy to figure out what was going on. You can easily filter down the data to what you're looking for. There's a bunch of automatic filters that you can apply. There's a bunch of default queries you can use as well to get started. Really, the best way to learn log analytics is to play with it, play with the queries, have a look at what's available, and always try and look at the service that you're trying to query and see what it makes available. Sometimes the portal doesn't always show you everything that you can query for. All right, and on to the final service I'm going to talk about today, app configuration. A common requirement in applications today is to separate the build process from the configuration process of your application. What that means is that you actually only end up building the application a single time, whether it's a Docker container, an Azure function, a desktop application, it doesn't really matter. And you apply the configuration separately. So the configuration isn't packaged with the application. It's really done separately, either by replacing certain values once you've actually built the artifact or supplying those values in some other way. So app configuration allows you to split out the configuration from the application. You can have it load the configuration either with a NuGet package. That's when the application starts up, it's going to pull down those configuration settings and apply them to your service. Or you could have it feed those values some other way. In Kubernetes, you could have it load those values into a config map, either through your deployment process or some other way. So I can already hear people tell me, why don't you just do JSON substitution in your deployment process? And of course, you can absolutely do that as well if you prefer that. App configuration allows you, gives you a little bit more power, though. The thing that I like most about it is that it's a one-stop shop where you can literally put all of your configuration. If you're doing variable replacement, if you're using, let's say, Azure DevOps or any other uh, CI CD tool like Octopus Deploy, your variables are going to be in different libraries and they can tend to be all over the place. The neat thing about app configuration is it allows you to have all of your configurations in that one place and then you can filter them down to whatever you need. It's all viewable at a glance within the Azure portal. The other neat thing is that if you're using the NuGet package I was mentioning to load the configuration at application startup, what you can actually have it do is you can have it react to changes that you make on the portal and the application will automatically detect those and reload the changed values. That means if you've coded your services so that they actually see those changes, you can make changes on the fly to your configuration and not have to restart the application. App configuration does have a certain cost associated to, of course. The billing is per request. So if your application is pulling down those changes frequently, you can quickly go over the limit. There are a few different tiers as well that you can use. But really, the way I usually do it is try and find a way that I can download the configuration and somehow find a way to apply it to the running service. 
whether that's through uh, environment variables, through a config map on Kubernetes, through a JSON file that you load at startup, really any way that you can download that data from Azure and read it in your application. And that's a wrap for the top three services that are hiding in plain sight in Azure. I hope you learned something useful. If you enjoyed this video, uh, please let me know in the comments and make sure to hit that like and subscribe button and I'll see you soon. Thanks.